My name is John McGuire. I am a writer here at the Gates Studios in Lowell, and uh, I make a practice of coming down here every day of the week. I split my time between uh, ed professional editing for uh, scientists who are making proposals to the NIH or to uh, the National Science Foundation, and the other part of my time I spend writing uh, new chapters for my writing book. So I am partly professional editor and partly a writing teacher. Uh, I love the Gates Building, I have a great office, and I'm surrounded by good people, it's a great place to work. The way I became a writer was I had a writer for a father. My father, John McGuire Sr., was a reporter at the Albany Times Union in Albany, New York, and at the end of my freshman year I needed a summer job. and. Uh, he got me a job as an editorial clerk on one of the local papers. So I went down there and I ran errands. I got coffee and uh, fried egg sandwiches for the editors. And I went down to the composing room and did a little bit of supervising and helping out. And uh, at the end of the summer, uh, I was able to get a part-time job on the Albany Times Union, also in Albany. And I worked there while I went through college. I was an English major. I worked on the college newspaper and then I went down on the weekends and I worked on the Albany Times Union where I covered police news which is car accidents, truck accidents and fires. I then went on and had a career as a reporter on a number of cities including Rochester, New York where I worked on the Democrat Chronicle and the Miami News. Uh, in all these places I was a science writer. I covered science and medicine wrote features, and I did that for about 10 years, and then I switched to public relations where I worked for a couple of big hospitals, putting out press releases and putting out magazines and newspapers for them. And around the middle of my career, I got a master's in fine arts and creative writing at University of Massachusetts at Amherst. And then I found myself looking for work, and I decided to try teaching writing. I had never intended to be a writing teacher, but when I got into it, I found out it went very easy. I remembered how I had learned how to write myself, and I found it thrilling to stand in front of the class and teach these youngsters what I knew about writing. And uh, they made rapid progress, and I had a new identity. I had been a reporter, and now I was a writing instructor. Fast forward a few decades, and uh, I have become more of a professional editor, and I continue to be a writing instructor. Uh, in my writing instruction, I work on my book, which is called John McGuire's College Writing Guide. Uh, it's in its second edition now, and I'm working on the third edition. People buy it online. They go to readablewriting.com and buy the book by clicking a button. When I teach students to write, I become very focused and obsessed on their writing with things that can be touched. It turns out to be very important for writers to be tangible in what they write. I'm not the first guy who figured this out. The most famous guy who figured this out was George Orwell. So I have found out in teaching freshmen and teaching people at all levels that telling people to be physical is a great start. I stumbled on this about 20 years ago when I was teaching writing at the Berkeley College of Music. One year I began my courses by telling students that they were to focus on things they could drop on their foot. I said this in the first two weeks of freshman comp and my students thought that I was nuts. On the other hand, they found it very amusing. Over the years, I've discovered that forcing students to pay attention to the physicalness of their writing forces them into being vivid. If you think of books that you've read that you remember, you really remember the objects in them. The Harry Potter stories are full of all kinds of mysterious objects, mysterious books, uh, wizard robes, special broomsticks, uh, mortars and pestles for mixing up uh, potions, and magical uh, animals like owls and frogs and newts. Everything in Harry Potter is incredibly physical. And Harry Potter books, the Harry Potter books, have sold millions and millions. Why has this happened? It's because the author, J.K. Rowling, knows 
that an interesting mix of physical objects keeps the reader intrigued. So my story and my doctrine and my church of writing says that you should start thinking about physical objects at the very beginning. Uh, you, when you do that, you find yourself being much more vivid than you previously thought you could be. That in fact is the difference between amateur writing and professional writing. Professional writing is significantly more physical. The key to being a good writer is aiming to be clear rather than being impressive. The very great writers impress us by their total clarity. So if you want to be a really great writer, your job is be totally clear. When you want to be completely clear, the trick is think of objects that the reader can see, think of characters that the reader can see, and think of actions that the reader can see your characters doing. The objects are called concrete nouns, the characters are conveyed with names and direct quotations, and the actions are conveyed with active verbs. If I could wave a magic wand over the head of everybody who wanted to be a writer, I would say, become obsessed with the active verb. I bet most people don't know that there are 17,000 active verbs in English. It's a huge treasure, tre treasure chest. 17,000 active verbs in English, it's a huge treasure of active verbs. But most beginning writers stick with just a few verbs like is and was and has. Uh, the key thing you need to do is branch out, play some of the other keys on the piano of the English language. When people ask me how I got into science writing, I tell them that I was a physics major who wanted to write rather than stay in the lab. So I did begin my college career as a physics major. I was a physics major for a couple of years. I found calculus difficult. I switched over to English. And then I became sort of a two cultures guy, namely very interested in science, but very interested in writing. So my career has had this mixture of science and writing ever since I've been about 22. And uh, not that many people specialize in it, but if you are seriously interested in science and you have great skill in writing, then there's a demand for what you do. Because most scientists can't write and most English majors can't really understand science. So that has been my career. It's still, um, it's still productive. And my, as a science editor, my key clients are uh, Harvard University School of Public Health, University of Michigan School of Public Health and the Dartmouth College Microbiology Department. These three institutions uh, send me work um, through the email. I edit the papers uh, in Microsoft Word track changes and send it back to them. They like the work. Um, they cut me some checks and I continue to uh, make a small living that way. It's very satisfying. You know, my interest as a, I write nonfiction, I don't write fiction. But my interest as a nonfiction writer is just clarity. So uh, the way I test my work is I read it sentence by sentence and I make sure that every sentence is completely clear. Uh, lots of beginners are unable to read their own work and judge it, but at my stage I can write a paragraph, read it, and say, huh, sentence five is off. It's slightly fuzzy. So I can immediately fix it. So uh, I edit my own stuff. I don't have to have anybody else improve my stuff. My stuff. I basically wear two hats. The one hat I put on is the production hat. And then the other hat I put on when I look at what I've written is the editor's hat. And I clean stuff up. So I love it. My favorite moment in the classroom comes usually about five or six weeks into a freshman comp class where a student raises his hands and he says, Mr. McGuire, the stuff you're telling us to do really works. That's my favorite moment, and it happens in every class. The light goes off over various kids' heads and they suddenly understand that these games I've been having them do, writing with objects, writing with active verbs, that it all adds up to really good writing. And these kids discover that they can write much better than they thought. In fact, a similar moment is when a kid comes in and says, you know, my writing doesn't look like it used to. It doesn't even look like I wrote it anymore. 
it's better than that. And so those are very satisfying moments because I really do believe, I really do believe that the ability to write clearly and excitingly is actually within everybody's reach if they're properly trained. It is not like, it's not like, you know, flying an airplane. Um, it doesn't take years and years of training to become a good writer. It just takes about, you know, three or four months of focused uh, effort and you can end up being a very good writer. And it makes everything you write from then on out look and be a lot more intelligent. In some ways, it's a way of raising your IQ. When you can write clearly, everybody around you says you're smarter than you used to be. So I find it very satisfying, very satisfying to help students transform themselves that way, uh, to perform it. I mean, it's mostly down to earth talk, but there is also some skill needed if you're gonna, gonna create a simple style on the page. It's about 80% write the way you talk, and the other 20% is know certain tricks to make things work on the page. Well, for fun, I like to read Elmore Leonard. I don't know if you've heard of Elmore Leonard. He, he just died about a year and a half ago. He had a long career, and he wrote uh, crime novels, beautifully uh, put together. A number of his books were made into movies. One was called Get Shorty, um, which is probably his best one. So I read Elmore Leonard uh, for fun. And as a serious writer, I read Saul Bellow. Uh, also died uh, probably in about the last five years. He's a, a Chicago Jewish writer, uh, won the Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, my favorite book of Saul Bellow's is an early book of his called Seize the Day. It's a single day, and it's a story of a man in Manhattan in the 1950s and what happens to him in a single day. Those are my two favorite writers. Saul Bellow for serious and Elmore Leonard for fun.